hello, I'm Dale Julin and welcome. Welcome to the Case Breakers Direct. In this segment, we will cover the true story of Robert W. Rackstraw, the last master outlaw, AKA D.B. Cooper. Uh, welcome, and what you're gonna hear about is a 10 year long investigation organized by Tom Colbert, the Case Breakers Task Force of more than 40 former lawmen and women hunted Rackstraw down in five countries where he hid behind 22 identities and pilot work, aircraft work for the CIA. Two of these incredible mystery busters are with me today. First, I want to introduce Jack Immendorf, a licensed PI, AKA known around San Francisco as the SF Dean of PIs, still active in the family business, who together with his son, Gene and wife, Bev, oversee a staff of skilled investigators headquartered in San Francisco for more than 50 years. Their cases taking them from California all over the U.S. and other countries, even the Russian Federation. Uh, many of their cases have been reported by worldwide media. D.B. Cooper is one of them. My second guest, Eric Kleinsmith, has covered has over 30 years experience as a U.S. Army military intelligence officer, defense contractor, academic. He was a counterintelligence commander in the Balkans back in the 1990s and is one of the subjects of the book, The Watchers by Shane Harris, which details his work in using cutting edge data mining techniques to identify and track Al Qaeda prior to 9-11. Eric is also the author of the 2020 book, Intelligence Operations, Understanding Data, Tools, People, and Processes. Folks, we've got some experts here on the subject of D.B. Cooper. I wanna start things off with Eric. Eric, tell us about this infamous hijacking of a plane uh, back in the early 1970s and why it became such a worldwide media sensation. Oh, sure. Thanks, Dale. For anybody who's who has not watched Marvel's Loki series, uh, the D.B. Cooper <laughs> was a hijacking attempt that took or a successful hijacking that took place on November 24th, 1971. It was a Northwest Orient uh, Flight 305 Airlines, which was originally scheduled to travel from Portland, Oregon to Seattle. Um, and uh, one gentleman got on the plane. Uh, under using the the name Dan Cooper on his uh, ticket, uh, sat near the rear of the plane, and as, as soon as the plane, or shortly after the, the aircraft took off, he signaled the flight attendant that uh, notified her that she that he had a suitcase with explosives on his lap, sitting in the in the back, and that uh, once uh, the plane landed in Seattle, he had this list of demands. Uh, part of his demand was to receive $200,000 in cash and to have the plane. Um, they, 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 they evacuated all the other passengers from the plane, but they kept the flight crew. Uh, this uh, gentleman then uh, directed them to fly along a specific route uh, toward the south as if they were moving toward uh, Mexico, so they had to fly back. Uh, the, the plane had to refuel in Seattle, uh, and then they, they took off again and had to fly back. Uh, he had also received four civilian parachutes. He, he turned down uh, military parachutes that were offered from Joint Base McCord, uh, which was close by in uh, Seattle. And, and once the, the, air, the aircraft was airborne, he directed the pilots uh, to fly at a certain altitude at a certain speed, knowing the type of aircraft that was just above stall speed was as slow as possible. And this particular aircraft had a back door and a back ramp um, that allowed him to in-flight op open that. And the flight crew did note that they felt a, a, a change in, an abrupt change in cabin pressure. Uh, and somewhere over the Northern California wilderness in the middle of the night, he jumped out and that's the last anyone had seen him. Uh, the speculation had grown because there was uh, no body that was found initially. There was, a, a, you know, a, a you know, multi-county search that had taken place. Uh, there was you know, no real evidence on the ground and it took years of investigation before uh, any scant piece of evidence had come up. But the, the reason why this story has become uh, almost to the point of myth and fo folklore status is that, the, quite honestly, is that he's never been found. The, the name Dan Cooper has never been verified as a real individual. So the, everything about this case uh, that, would seem, that would seem fairly understood as a fact has changed over the years. And so if, you know, he's He's got a, a cult following and fan base that that uh, gets together every year at CooperCon. 
to discuss who he might be, or just really to celebrate the fact that uh, a, a no-named individual was able to pull off just such a massive, spectacular crime. And to this day, the the FBI and the and the uh, transportation, I'm sorry, the Federal Aviation Authority has never solved the case officially. Uh, that's kind of where we stand as our, our as our team took this case on in uh, late 2011. And we've been working this now again, this has been 11 years. Uh, and somebody who's been working the case on the other side of the coin, as in the main suspect, Bob Rackstraw, is you, Jack. You as a PI, uh, let's ask you to take a moment and for our audience to kind of frame who Rackstraw was. He died in 2019. For years, you investigated him because he was nefarious, not a hero, not a folk hero, but a nefarious crook. And you were, started, were hired by a family member to investigate the death of his stepfather. Let's start right there. Well, actually, I was hired by a gentleman named Bill Rackstraw to look into the sudden disappearance of his brother. His brother, Philip Rackstraw, lived in Calaveras, uh, California, and was actually the stepfather of Robert Wesley Rackstraw. And sometime around July of 1997, Philip just suddenly disappeared. Most unusual because his mother, who was probably about 85 then, and his brother, my client, Bill Raxall, had regular weekly communications with him, which all of a sudden just ceased. It was totally out of character. About a month after this occurred, it turns out that Philip uh, sold, actually sold property that belonged to the missing brother, Philip, 10 acres and a house trailer. And uh, Bill became very, very concerned. He was aware that there had been some neighbors who heard some loud arguments taking place between the two gentlemen. And now his brother was mysteriously missing. He called our staff, talked to me as a private investigator, wanted me to look into the disappearance. I have many cases that people call in, have concerns that really don't turn out to be anything significant. So the first thing I wanted to know, did you notify the authorities? Yes, there's a missing persons report. Calaveras County Sheriff's Office had the case. He'd been dealing with them for several months now, but had no information other than don't worry about it. Uh, we've talked to his stepson, he's in Hawaii. His wife had died recently. He was very sad. He was probably on a major bender, drinking and just disappeared in Hawaii. Well, I relayed this story to Bill, who had already heard it from the sheriff's office, but uh, he was convinced that it wasn't true. And in the meantime, we commenced some investigation in Calaveras County. We talked to many people, neighbors, people he might have been in business in, realized that there were a lot of very unusual happenings on the part of Robert Wesley Rackstraw. He had a very questionable background. There were things going on. He started suspecting Bob Rackstraw, AKA D.B. Cooper, well, in the killing of his stepfather, and then there was a the discovery of the body. Where? Well, well, let, let's let's put it in some type of chronological order. We became convinced that Philip Rackstraw hadn't gone anywhere. He was probably still in Calaveras County, probably not among the living. I confronted the sheriff with this again, and now the tune was changed a little bit. It was obvious that they weren't being straight with me. The tune was, well, maybe he maybe he hasn't left Calaveras. Maybe he is here. Maybe he's somewhere. But I don't think you'll ever find him. With all the mine shafts and holes out here, you throw the body in, a stick of dynamite later, and it's all over. So we're never going to find him. What, what a hell of a uh, introduction and final admission. Well, in the meantime, our investigation included a conversation with a former drinking buddy 
of Robert Wesley Ragstraw, who just incidentally one night mentioned something about his interest in a job in the Middle East dealing with helicopters. And this was before he disappeared. Well, after we conducted some additional investigation, we discovered that the only helicopter operation that was of any significance was in uh, Iran. And uh, there were people there working for the Shaw initially, teaching his pilots and everything. We kind of concluded, and with our further investigation, decided that Braxtraw was in fact in Iran. The Sheriff's Department finally contacted me again. I hadn't shared that with him yet. And finally, they opened up and let me know, well, this is more than just a possible murder or missing person. We know that the FBI is involved in this, and there is a suspicion that this missing Robert Wesley Reichstraw could in fact be the infamous, the infamous skyjacker, D.B. Cooper. And they wanted to know if we could share information because they had no idea where he was. And it was at that point that I decided to share this with them. And I let them know that I thought they could probably find him in Iran working for Bell Helicopter. Now, the ironic part of this story is that one of my investigators who I had worked with and who was familiar with my investigation, a gentleman that uh, his name was, uh, his, well, we don't, I guess, his, his name we can talk about later, but he suddenly disappeared one night after I had let everyone know where Rackstraw was. I didn't know till years later that this investigator came into my office one day, wanted some uh, to be paid in advance for a job he was working, turned in a couple of audio tapes, which contained information on the investigation he was working on, collected a check and disappeared. And I had never saw him again. Overnight, his house was empty, he was gone. It was only many years later, after getting uh, confidential information, which Tom Colbert got, I think, through the Freedom of Information Act, a letter from the president of Bell Helicopter in Iran talking about this gentleman, Andy Arkea, who just happened to work for Immendorf and Company Investigations in San Francisco, who, who was allegedly my chief investigator who worked on all my high profile cases. And he is the one who discovered all about Mr. Rackstraw and Mr. Rackstraw's possibility of being someone sought by the FBI. And the bottom line, and, I find- And Jack, if I may, and, and if I may, looking at, at the time, right, for the entire story to be told, I got to zip forward and say, they went after AKA D.B. Cooper for the murder of his stepfather, uh, Philip, and they found a body up in California, uh, up in Calaveras County uh, at that time. Um, and they put Rackstraw on trial for the murder of his stepfather, right? Well, what happened is I, I opined that the body was up there, probably buried on his property near the trailer because immediately after he disappeared, he had uh, he had a couple of dogs. One was named Bingo, and they were they were just like two peas in a pod. And Bingo, Philip had disappeared, but Bingo was seen wandering around the trailer and wandering around the property. And I thought that the sheriff's office should maybe look into the possibility that Philip was buried there. Well, they didn't. They listened to me. They did nothing about it. But then we, California had been in a big drought for many years. We had a rain. And at that point, I talked to them again about looking for depressions because sometimes if there's a disturbance in the earth, as you well know, after, after a, a drought like that, the rain, well, guess what? They went up there. They did find some depressions. They started poking around. They, they discovered the body, but didn't dig it up completely. Once they hit something solid, they got a search warrant. They went and they dug and they did pull the body up. It was Philip and in a sort of kneeling position with two bullets in the back of his head. I believe the grave was dug with one scoop of a backhoe 
you know, and the body went in, two bullets in the back of the head and a bag of lime on top of him. And at that point, of course, we had a murder. And yes, they went to Iran. They managed to have, by confiding with Bell Helicopter, providing this information, what they already had, they managed to get him terminated. And he, at that time, if you had no legitimate yeah. reason to be in there, you had to be out within a period of time. So Robert Wesley Roxraw was on his way out of Iran, back to New York. And of course, on the plane riding with him were some federal investigators. And upon and arriving took, in New York- Jack, if I may sum, would, sum up for a second, Jack, if I may, I, I want to, for the sake of levity, I want to get to the part where they take him into custody, they put him on trial. Eric, if I may get back to you on this, uh, that trial was so interesting to me. And of course, Jack, you're in, but you, you testified in that. Um, but uh, suddenly, this master uh, of deception, suddenly, Rackstraw, thinking he could be uh, convicted of murder, of murdering his stepfather, he suddenly, Eric, pick up on the fact that he's suddenly having to use a wheelchair. Why? He, that's part of the sympathy ploy that, that uh, you know, he had to be, I think it was carried off the plane as the, the plane landed and see, and uh, it was a, a complete persona that he was able to get on. And again, this, this one story typifies the, his entire case, uh, his, his entire life of one, and I call it grifting case after another, whether it was while he was flying uh, uh, helicopters in Vietnam, uh, and then all of a sudden got wrapped up in Air America flights. Uh, he was able to talk his way on there until his uh, the troop commander for the Operation Left Bank uh, discovered that he uh, lied about the fact that he had a top secret clearance to be able to perform those missions, and he did not. Uh, and so that was you know this one trial was again a a total show, a, a total fabricated persona that he was able to bring on at just the opportune time. Uh, very similar. And this is, again, why one of his ex-wives called him Bullshit Bob. Uh, and mm -hmm. she he, she couldn't believe a thing that he had said. And that's the the pattern of, of the lifestyle that he had adopted. And this went in through small business, you know, uh, several uh, small business ventures that he had been in, employed with the, the bringing, the taking on the persona of Normandy Winter as a millionaire, um, a, a Swiss banker, who then was able to grift off an entire Northern California town for a period by, by taking on the name of Dick Winters, who jumped into Normandy and using that as a twist of words of Normandy Winter, uh, promising every, everyone in the town that he would either sleep in their homes or borrow money or, uh, or whatever he had done, uh, saying that I am, a, you know, as a Swiss millionaire, I'm going to bring you all to my chalet in Switzerland and we're going to have a great party and this this is my way of paying you back in the future. It's the the, per, the proverbial, uh, I, I don't have money for a hamburger today, but I, I'll pay you on Tuesday type thing. Um, mm -hmm. So this one episode of then being arrested for the murder of his stepfather is uh, was totally in character with somebody of his personality who quite frankly displayed uh, narcissistic sociopath tendencies of uh, focusing only on himself um, you know, almost in a bipolar way of, you know, anything else, the, the ends justify the means. So if I have to lie, if I have to be carried off of this aircraft, this is what I'm going to do in order for me to continue the, my, my lifestyle of uh, working as little as possible and reaping the benefits of everybody else's hard work. He had fun with it too, Jack. I mean, as a pathological liar, uh, nothing was, was passed to my looking uh, in, the, in the book, Master, last Master Outlaw, and at one point, there's a picture of him hanging with Charlton Heston at Rod Laver's famous tennis club, um, just kind of hanging out, having a beer with Charlton Heston. Another time, he goes to the uh, Playboy Club uh, with, with friends and calls ahead of time, and the next thing you know, they think he's Governor Reagan, then Governor Reagan's personal driver, so they give him a great place, and he just over and over and over again. No lie was too big for this guy, right, Jack? Yeah, he got around and he was a pretty good uh, liar, if you want to put it that way. And, you know, I would like to say something about the trial. Uh, we met, I met with the DA who was going to prosecute the case on several occasions. And there was a mountain of material that I think could have been introduced 
we talked about my testimony, what we were going to do at the trial. And I was absolutely shocked when I showed up and I came into the courtroom and they wheeled him in in the wheelchair. And believe me, if looks could kill, he looked at me with those eyes and it was incredible. Uh, he was in the wheelchair, as I said. The case that I was able to see and what I followed up on later on had nothing to do with the trial prep that we had gone through. I never quite understood why we spent all of this time going into the questions, the people we had met, the evidence we had, everything that pointed to the fact that nobody but Robert Wesley Raxall could have murdered my client's brother, Philip. You know, and yeah. it was he just a sham after that. And yeah. he got off. He got, he got off. off. And, and, Absolutely. and Eric, on that note, then Tim, amazing thing too, and Jack, you could chime in on this. Shortly thereafter, he was going to be charged on other uh, unrelated charges, fraud, that sort of thing, right? So okay. you hear you hear a report on of you're driving along Santa Cruz, <laughs> Monterey, where Rackstraw was originally from, uh, from doing the first I'm, things. I'm, Yes, I'm driving and, and home. What you hear, what you hear, is a report of a mayday of a plane going down in the Monterey Bay, and it's supposedly Rackstraw, but that wasn't a plane going down, was it? Again, that's the thing: is he was able to uh, stage this this downing of his aircraft in the ocean. So obviously, it's, you're not going to find any evidence of a crash if it was done on land. So it's a perfect setting. He flies under the radar. He's able to disappear for another few months, and in doing so, he. he he shakes the tail of again of investigators again. Uh, as again, this is a a you see the, the his ability to get off or his ability to avoid justice is really an artwork because he's able to do it over and over and over to the point where it's the, again like you said no lie was too big. Well, well, no excuse and no plan to to better himself or to escape any kind of prosecution was too great. Um, and, and that's, again, as, as a typical piece. And that's why, you know, when you get to the point of tying this guy back to, besides all the other stuff he was doing, tying him back to D.B. Cooper, you, you see that it's just, you know, one of the complaints or, or one of the, na the some of the naysayers are like, well, this is all circumstantial evidence. But when you build something like this, you have to be able to fit the personality with the audaciousness of the crime and what took place. This is the perfect personality and the perfect background to pull off a crime like he did. All right. So, Jack, pick up on that. In the final 15 minutes of our podcast, I want to tie this nefarious pathological liar who probably you know, got off on the murder of his, his stepfather, has uh, a slew of ex-wives and girlfriends who he cheated along the way in so many different ways tie this guy's personality and the circumstantial evidence to D.P. Cooper, Jack. Why is he Rackstraw D.P. Cooper in your mind? Well, I mean, you have to remember that my involvement in this whole case was simply to find a missing man. I completed my investigation. I found him. We brought the body home. My client was happy. My other involvement was simply follow up afterwards because this guy was suspected, Robert Wesley Raxall, of being D.B. Cooper. And I followed up. I was very interested in the case and learned a lot more about it afterward because my primary concern in the beginning was simply to find his his missing uh, stepfather. Why do you think he was D.B. Cooper? Why do I think he was D.B. Cooper? Because he had the training, the background, the ability, and the criminal mind, I think, it would take to do something like this. And I've seen evidence of it everywhere that we turn. In addition, I cannot uh, understand why the federal authorities would have, I won't say kidnapped, but they pulled a sting by pulling Andy Arkea, who disappeared just overnight. Unbelievable. I didn't ever hear about him for years later. Well, they took him away from me after I advised them of where they would find Braxtroll. They planted Andy Arkea in, in Bell Helicopter in Iran, obviously, I guess, to ingratiate himself 
with Rackstraw and maybe find out a little bit more. Maybe did they do this for a murder? I don't think they did. This was a local murder. I don't know whether it would have violated any federal law. Why would the FBI be so in, to go and take someone out of my employ, take them to Iran, build up a phony background for them, plan them there? Now, what does that tell you? Tells you a lot. I mean, Eric. there was enormous interest in their minds that this was, in fact, D.B. Cooper, as That's told right. me no. by the sheriff. There you go. Okay, so once again and again and again over this history of several decades, it's, it is clear that the FBI was looking at D.B. Cooper. There were published reports. There was TV news reports about Rackstraw possibly being D.B. Cooper. Pick that up, Eric, if you would, please, mm -hmm. uh, because when the case breakers got into this and started working on it, uh, the FBI was at first very cooperative, then not so much. And you had to, as a team with Tom and company, confront Rackstraw with the fact that he was D.B. Cooper. Go into the confrontation. How did that come out? Now, the, this one, the confrontation was uh, a, it was a, a second, a two-pronged approach. The first was a, what we call a, a casual source approach, at least, at least in, in Army military terms, where you're just do, uh, doing some innocent questioning and talking to them. And one of the things that we had done, and Tom came to me and said, you know, I, I'm, I'm having, a, a, you know, I've got pages and pages and pages of, of evidence and data that we've put together, but I'm, I'm having a hard time getting folks to take a look at it. So we we built this amazing link chart uh, and the job that I was in at the time was as uh, running a, a training program for army intelligence analysts. And so we were using some of our data mining tools and some of our uh, visualization tools to take all this data and to put it into this great link chart and it became poster size. Uh, we took that poster and we presented it to him and uh, our, our investigators that, that Tom and, uh, and his uh, uh, partners at the time uh, were told Rackstraw that we were the first approach was that you know we're doing this you know documentary on DB Cooper we you know you've been fingered we'd like you to see if you could you know what what do you think about the case and just to get just to see if we can elicit some uh, some admissions or some some verifications and we showed him this entire chart that was on the second day and said look this is all the information we have in you and he verified pretty much every part of the chart just says, yeah, I know that guy. They, yep, they, oh, yeah, you got this this person here. And yeah, he was a friend of mine. But, um, you know, and, and that was the, the second approach was that was that was then what you call a cold approach, where it was like, look, we know it's you. Uh, we'd like you to come forward. And, you know, his answers were very evasive, but they were also very truthful in how he and how he said that. He goes, yeah, I'm sure you would like to know us, but I'm sure also the FBI would like to know us. And he alluded to uh, other indictments that he had been uh, either sealed indictments or whatever. And so anybody would love to get their hands on me. And so, and, and our approach was, look, you didn't kill anybody in this hijacking attempt. It still is hijacking. So it still is, you know, under, there's no statute of limitations for it. But if you did come forward, you would probably get an extremely light sentence with your age. Uh, and then you'd never have to buy a beer for the rest of your life. You would be a celebrity uh, a character, for, you know, for the rest, you know, for however long you, you wanted. You walk into every bar, you'd be famous, and people would drive by your drinks. And he, and he, he still turned it down he just by saying the same things. And, and that's when we really realized that because of the other things that he had done, because of the tie to the murder of his stepfather, because of, I mean, there's other crimes of uh, alleged theft of explosives from Nash, California right. National Guard Army. I mean, there's there some really nefarious things that he was involved with. And so by, by uh, fessing up to the, the identity of D.B. Cooper that he had caused this would really open himself up to more investigations on some of the other, you know, other crimes that he had most likely committed through his entire life. Yeah, Jack, pick up on that if you would for, for me, please. You know, this guy, when I uh, read the book, The Last Master Outlaw, and then reread it, to get ready for this interview, I was just stunned by how this guy, uh, I think it might have been you that called it, he had linebacker eyes. When, he, when you mentioned he, he, he entered the courtroom in that wheelchair, his eyes are darting around, he's looking at you like he wants to put a hole through your head. Well, uh, and uh, he yeah, had I, a I, way, I was gonna say he had he a was... way though of, of really conning 
wives and girlfriends and buddies into just giving them giving them stuff. Yeah, he he was a, he was a master con man, <laughs> along with everything else. And you talked about his background and why we thought that he was actually D.B. Cooper. Look at his background. He was a fixed wing pilot. He was a rotary wing pilot. He was a specialist in parachuting. I think one of the specialties was ring jumping. He knew everything about the plane he was on. He knew the speed, the stalling speed, and it was a 727, which you may remember the back ramp. Went. This guy was an expert in every way. I can't think of anyone more qualified to pull something off like this. Yeah. I mean, his background was absolutely perfect. I don't know uh, anyone who could have done it better than him. And All right. uh, so, I, Jack, I mean, on that note, mind. Eric, yeah, Eric, on that note, pick up on that because uh, people want to know what was his motive. Why was he throwing out the military? Because he not only because he lied about his his clearance, and that started the the more intense look at his background, but he also lied about the qualifications that he needed to become a first lieutenant or a lieutenant, and then promoted to first lieutenant. Um, he he lied that he had batch, uh, two bachelor's degrees, and of course he didn't have that either. And so he was ejected from the military, and that's you know. It, it then you take that set of experiences now jump fast forward to while he was on the aircraft and one of the flight attendants asked him, said, you know, what do you have? Why are you pissed off against Northwest Airlines? And he says, I'm not pissed off against Northwest Airlines. I'm just pissed off. And, and so you understand that the, the focus of his anger was not the flight, the, the, the airlines or anybody on the flight. He was he was very cordial with everybody on the flight. Um, his motive was that he was angry with the system, which, you know, during the time of 1971, you see this is the start of the uh, disaffection with the, the war in Vietnam, uh, an entire, you know, uh, uh, a culture changing within the U.S. And so sticking it to the man is, is, is part of why he is accepted or condoned and, and, and you know, cherished and, and uh, um has such celebrity attention as a mythic folk hero because here's a guy that did stick it to the man and he got away with it and when you see with this life again it's time and time again this was not the first time he was going to do it and it was obviously not the last time well, ladies and gentlemen these are members of the case breakers and if you'd like more information on how to get involved with the case breakers on a voluntary basis or to make a donation please go to the casebreakers.org i want to also Ask for your final thoughts, gentlemen, in just a moment. But first, I want to make sure that folks know this. First of all, this all this information can be found in The Last Master Outlaw, written by Tom Colbert and Tom Solisi, a book about the true life story of this veteran paratrooper, CIA pilot, and four-time felon, Bob Rackstraw, who passed away in 2019. And you should look forward to this, folks, because a coming Netflix, Netflix four-hour documentary entitled D.B. Cooper, Where Are You?, is set to stream beginning July 13th. But if you want the full story and evidence uh, that this talk is based on, you can pick up The Last Master Outlaw, the only book of dozens with not one, but three national awards for true crime. Uh, Jack first, and then Eric, finally, your final thoughts here on what you hope the Netflix documentary will be able to accomplish, because there's still a lot of folks who don't believe that Rackstraw was D.B. Cooper. What do you hope, Jack, from the... Uh, release of this Netflix documentary? Well, I hope that it might finally bring the mystery of D.V. Cooper to a successful conclusion. I think the work and the the book by uh, Tom Colbert and Tom uh, Saluzzi is an excellent reference and very accurately describes and brings to the public the true, true identity of this mystery, which has yet to be resolved, except it may be resolved now. And it is, as you pointed out earlier, the only unsolved skyjacking uh, attempt in US history. Uh, I think the book and the series will finally answer the questions that we've all been wanting to hear. Eric, your thoughts, final thoughts on, on the Netflix documentary and the, and the books? Well, I, and again, I know we poured a lot of hard work in this. Like I said, we've been working this uh, for 11 years. Uh, and again, nobody's making a dime off of this. This is just you know something that we do because 
it's there. The, the, that's why do all uh, true crime aficionados, even amateur sleuths, do this kind of thing? Because they they want to solve the mysteries. They want to uh, um, you know balance the uh, justice out. And so this documentary is just the reason why it's it should be important is because it does break down the life of this of this guy. Now there is you know going to be a lot of different evidence in there. It's, it's four hours worth. Um, there is going to be, it's, it is going to be like every other documentary does, it's going to raise more questions uh, for all the viewers, especially if you have if anybody that has any kind of confirmation bias that says, you know, this is not the guy. I totally believe it's this guy. You know, you check, check any YouTube video in the comments and half of the comments are it's, uh, no, it's Loki. You know, the, again, going back <laughs> to Marvel and that's, it, as the jokes. But um this is one of those stories that will persist forever and until until there's interest is lost. And so while Robert Rackstraw died three years ago, the the D.B. Cooper lives on forever. Um, and so that's what this is going to be about. It's one of these uh, the, what we call the, the holy grails of unsolved true crime cases. Um, it, it's, it's so strikingly interesting to look at this guy's background and the things that he had done. You know, my. You know, my sincere hope is that the, the documentary portrays the work we had done in, in a fair light. And I think that they do. I was really impressed with with all the work they had done um, in interviewing us. But they, again, but they also brought in folks with countering opinions, and I'm glad they did that. Yeah. So if I may, uh, if you are a true crime uh, aficionado, ladies and gentlemen, if you are, if you are a true crime fan, uh, there's no better true crime than the last master outlaw describes in the book about D.B. Cooper and the coming Netflix documentary, which is D.B. Cooper, Where Are You? Once again, start sets the stream July 13th. Check it out, four hours. Jack Immendorf and Eric Kleinsmith, my expert guest today. This is a ripping good read and you told a ripping good tale. Thank you, gentlemen, I appreciate it. Great, thank you. All right, and for more information on how to get involved with the Case Breakers or make a donation, because these are volunteers, folks. They're not making money off this. Go to thecasebreakers.org. Dale Julin, have a good day.